I've been in and out of Bitcoin from 2014, 2015, and now I'm into Ethereum, and I, I love it so far. So Pegasus is, um, you know, our, our key phrase is we're decentralized in the future. Um, we're creating a mainnet Ethereum client written in Java, and we're also going to be writing the same client software. We're going to extend it for bits that's going to be useful for enterprise Ethereum and enterprise use cases. Um, how many people here have heard of Quorum? That's one type of a solution we're shipping. We're also um, going to be shipping a lot of other different things like uh, uh, non-proof-of-work consensus mechanisms and other useful things. So the things we're focusing on and things we're adding are privacy, obviously, which private transactions get stability. Um, it's one of the reasons we're building on Java is because it's, um, it's, got, it's, it's, it's been worked on since the 20th century. It's had all sorts of stability stuff built into it. It's got an amazing tool chain to guarantee the stability. Scalability. Um, you know, it can scale up pretty well. Ease of deployment, you know, everyone can get a Java. You can just, actually, just last week one of our people did, you can do brew Pantheon on a Mac. And you have a Pantheon node that you can run right there. And also we're adding permission and access control, some of the features we're adding. Now a little bit more about, consent, about Pegasus. Um, we're a spoken consensus, but we're also, you know, a 50-person team, and we're across about 50, uh, 10 different time zones. Um, we've got a large team in Brisbane, Australia. We've got one guy in New Zealand. We've got some people in Europe. We've got some people in the US and Canada. So we are truly a globally distributed organization. Um, trying to schedule meetings where we get absolutely everyone to show up is, is a challenge. <laughs> some, yes, yes, they, they really get to you. Some of the people I work with in Australia have to wake up at 5 in the morning to make some of these meetings. I'm like, oh man, I'm sorry. So. It's kind of funny how it coincides with Yep, and it works. You just build your teams around the time zones. You can make it work. Um, and we're split up into three, you know, three main thrusts for our development effort. Product, that's the team I'm mostly on, and we're building the Ethereum blockchain, the Java executable that you can build and deploy. We have an R&D team. This team is working on some of the Ethereum 2.0 slash Serenity features. Um, we have uh, Ben Eddington, who is, um, if you saw Ethereum's, uh, if you saw Vitalik's presentation, he was using some of the slides that Ben had written and has taken the charge of making Ethereum 2.0 work with. So we've got some people that are deeply involved in the future of Ethereum 2.0 employed as part of Pegasus. And we're also working on standards. Um, we have several people who are on the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance standarding, standardization um, committee. I don't know how to, how to describe those things, those multi-company things. But the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance hmm? committee? Working group or something. Working group. Yeah, working groups we're looking for. So it's a working group. They're putting together a bunch of um, standards for enterprise Ethereum. And I have a slide on that that's going to talk a little bit later about what some of those standards are talking about. But part of the, the key thing that we're trying to balance between is the balance between public Ethereum and enterprise chains. Um, it's something where we think some of our best opportunities are going to be to get companies to use something that could go on the public chain but doesn't have to. So when, when Ethereum 2.0 launches, and they're able to get some of the privacy features like ZK Snarks, which are you know, supposed to be coming onto there, and the ability to do sharding in stronger side chains, that they'll be ready to make the jump so that Ethereum can be big for everyone. It can be used for everything that you want to be. We're trying to make sure that every possible scenario that people might want to use is possible. Now, whether or not they'll use it, that's a different story, and that's what we're going to be working to try and achieve in the next couple of years. But you know, some of the advantages of Ethereum is it's got a large developer community um, as far as all the blockchain projects, I haven't seen a, a more inviting large community than I have inside of Ethereum. Um, I went to, I was astonished at how big ETH Denver was. I'd just been getting into this for a few, uh, for a few months really serious into Ethereum and just the sheer number of people and the sheer positive vibes I got out of that compared to like, say, um, a Bitcoin block size call. You know, there's quite a different experience there. And, you know, but the public Ethereum has problems, you know, it's, it's getting kind of large. In enterprise Ethereum, you know, you get faster, but you get at the cost of not being able to share it with the world. You have to limit who can see it. Some enterprises consider that a feature. We also want to facilitate new types of corporations that will embrace this radical transparency to make it possible. And at the same time, you know, we're not limiting ourselves to any one of them. So in enterprise Ethereum, we're, we're trying to combine these two together to get the best of both worlds and try and solve each other's problems. So the way that... Um, Pegasus is going about doing this, um, is we're working with the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance to define some of these enterprise features. 
Um, it's full of, Santander is a big northeastern bank, uh, northeastern US. Um, British Petroleum, JP Morgan, Accenture is a big consulting firm, Microsoft. Those are just a few of the marquee names that are part of the Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. There's like 500 different companies that are um, involved in this Enterprise Ethereum process. And they're putting together you know, a specification that is designed to work around core Ethereum. Now what we shipped a couple weeks ago is Pantheon Core. It is a mainnet compatible client. So you can set it up and you can run it and it'll sync with Ethereum. It'll sync with the mainnet. You know, it's, it, syncing with the mainnet takes a long time if you want a full archival node, but we can do it just as good as everyone else. Um, has the full support of the transaction ledger, has the virtual machine, and also has the public consensus mechanisms. We support ETH, the click, and I think, I don't think we have the parity POA. But what our plan for the future is, is we're gonna ship um, Pan uh, Pantheon Enterprise around the core, and it's gonna depend on the core and use the core. And we're gonna be providing features that enterprises are asking for. Private consensus mechanisms like IBFT, um, Istanbul, Byzantine Fault Tolerance, um, and some of the other ones. What is I? The I stands for Istanbul and Byzantine Fault Tolerance. Um, we're looking into PBFT is another variant. There's all sorts of these BFT variants. Um, some corporations like some more than others. So we're gonna make these consensus mechanisms pluggable so they work. Um, Click is kind of a BFT variant. Um, they, I don't know exactly precisely which one that they use inside of there, but it's another proof of authority. You go on around Robin, you take your turn. If someone misses a turn, you can post a block. You can skip the line if they don't come back. It's, there's, there's a whole, there's, you could probably do a whole presentation on BFT stuff, and it'll probably be a good one to watch. Um, but you know, we, the other consensus mechanism is wrapped is one that might be becoming popular. Um, they also want to integrate private transactions. Quorum is one of the ways to do that. And there are some other ways that we're looking at doing that with things like ZK snarks. Um, roles and permissioning is another big one because it's inside enterprises. The idea of having only one key that can control your, um, your accounts kind of scares some people. <coughs> some people are fine with it, some people don't want it. And there's also issues that you want to be able to en enable an HR department to act on behalf of a contract so anyone in the HR could do it. So we're gonna be providing some smart contracts to provide that sort of support um, for roles and permissioning so that you could act in behalf of a role that you might have. Um, monitoring and business intelligence. Um, these are some of the, uh, the enterprise features. They want to be able to run a fleet of these nodes and be able to monitor it in their existing monitoring tools, which are some of the things we're going to be shipping. Um, any questions? Is, is this actually on Ethereum or is it separate blockchain? Um, both. Some of our customers don't want to be on the public chain. They want to have their own private chain and their solution to a lot of their privacy is just to run it on the internet and nobody gets to see their blockchain but them. Um, that's the, some of the processes some people want to go through. Um, so some of them they do a consortium, like some of this private network might not be a company, it might be like five exchange trading partners and they trust each other about as far as they can throw them. So they use a blockchain for the shared ledger. Um, another situation would be like the, uh, the lettuce example. Um, Walmart's running a lettuce uh, when you farm your lettuce, they want it quote unquote on the blockchain. So that's the sort of thing where the farm doesn't have the interest in keeping the blockchain, the distributor doesn't have sole interest, Walmart doesn't have sole interest, because you don't know you're selling to Walmart and you pick that lettuce, you might be selling it to Chipotle, you might be setting it to Kroger. So they set up a consortium, and the consortium owns the distributed, because no one really owns the blockchain in that sort of a situation, but everyone benefits from it. So rather than pulling off every leaf of romaine lettuce off the shelves, they can figure out where the problem was, they can identify where it was, and they can just pull off, you know, one farm's output that came from that domain. And in a situation like that with a supply chain, um, it's hard to say who really has the most vested interest in that data. So if you make a consortium that can span the whole industry and everyone contributes to it, that's why you'd want a distributed ledger because Walmart's gonna keep a database that covers only their, their concerns, a shipper only their concerns, and a lettuce picker only their concerns, and you can't get them together really easily. So that's part of the vision that I see that blockchains can provide. And also, in some cases you don't need a blockchain, but to put a blockchain in provides the impetuous to um, re-examine their business processes at the same time too. So there's a kind of a catalyst that goes on with that too. So there's two reasons why you might want a blockchain. Because you really need it or because it's the catalyst to do what you really need to do. You had a question? That's the exact question I was gonna ask. What are those flyers and vendors uh, really small yeah. Yep. How many enterprise on Ethereum right now? Yeah. 
right now that meet the EEA standard, there's none. Um, the standard just started out really pushing out standards within the past few months. So they're iterating with the involved partners. You know, this is rather than, so um, James Berry in Denver is writing a series of articles on standardization. Um, so this is kind of a hot topic. So rather than a de jour standard where this is what everyone's doing, let's standardize it like IEEE does. Um, we're putting together standards to say this is what the people who want to use an enterprise blockchain, these are the features they want to see. So I don't, can't remember the exact name of, of that kind of a standard, but it's more of a prescriptive, here's what we want it to look like, here's what it needs to be able to do. Is that more of a protocol than a standard? Um, when I think of protocol, I think of the fiddly little bits the engineers care about. So we're not in the EEA, they're not defining too much of the protocol. Um, as much as, you know, you will provide some sort of role and permissioning system. You will provide multiple consensus mechanisms. Um, you may expose parameters on these consensus mechanisms, you know. You may provide, you know, monitoring stuff. These are the sort of things. The EEA 2.0 spec is out there, you can read it, and they, they do use the standardized must, may, should, should not, must not type enumerations in there. And that's currently, yeah, currently there, there are, you know, Quorum doesn't do it, Geth doesn't do it, Parity, um, Pantheon doesn't do it yet either, but that's what we're working towards, to get it together so that um, we can fill that standard. And um, I think they just published two specs, one of them related to trusted, it, execution that IBM wants, not IBM, Intel wants to do for their, for their chips to run a trusted Ethereum contract inside their chips. Uh, forgive me if this is too high level, but uh, for private chains to exist, is it going to be built on top of the public Ethereum blockchain or is it going to hard for it? So our strategy, some of them may exist on the public Ethereum blockchain. It may exist in a couple ways. One of them might be through a side chain where you pin your commitments to the, to, the, to, the, to the main chain, and if you have assets, you bring them back and forth at the pinning points. Um, some of them might actually run part of it on a public chain and have a private uh, quorum type constellation thing behind it. And some of these private chains might have zero connection to Ethereum, you know, they might be running, you know, we might consider it a test net, you know, they'd run a, a test net, but instead of a test net, it's their, their corporate net, where they're the only ones that mine on it, and they're the only ones that can approve and push transactions on. So it could, could be built on Ethereum, but at the core, what we want them to be able to do is going to be able to run the same, con the same EVM contracts and have the same interface with it as if they were talking to a main, main net client. So we're gonna ship an enterprise solution that also uses the, uh, uses the Ethereum protocols underneath. Whether or not it's on main net is a business decision. So the way the block verification would work mostly goes into the, the consensus mechanisms. So Ethereum would use a, uh, a proof of work to prove that everyone gets what, gets, um, what, the, what, the, what the canonical tip of the chain is. And for private consensus, you would get together a certain amount of validators. You can vote validators in or out. You might have to set it up ahead of time. It's, it's really a complex thing that I don't understand. I let the researchers tell us what to do. Um, but in essence, you know who the validators are, you identify them, at least to the people who care about the blockchain, they know who the validators are. I might not know who the validators are and I might not know to trust them, but the people using the blockchain would know enough to trust those validators. So and that presents some, um, some interesting challenges when you come in with a third party, but in those cases we'd be targeting people like, like the, the cluster of stockbrokers who want to trade a special stock. They would all know each other, they would nominate validators and they would trust them within their sphere. So part of our, um, our roadmap here, split up into the three main things of what we're, what we're shipping. In the core, we're gonna be shipping, you know, uh, FastSync, which is kind of changing right now. Um, we presented, you know, our plans to do FastSync and then get in parity came and said, we're getting rid of FastSync, we're gonna, we're gonna be changing it. So, so um, that's, that's TBD, everything is, is changing quickly in Ethereum. We're also gonna work on performance. For enterprise features, as mentioned, we have P, which is practical, Practical Byzantine Fault Tolerance. Ooh, that's a spelling error, PFBT. Um, I didn't put this slide together. I couldn't even get the source. Um, other alternative consensuses, permissioning, initial privacy, and side chains. And side chains is one of the more exciting things that I'm excited about. I saw a presentation about it from our R&D presenters the other day. We also have 
we have our R&D group, and our R&D group is working on the Ethereum 2.0 or Serenity stuff. The first stuff they're working on is a beacon chain, and then they're going to try and ship sharding on top of the beacon chain, and then state execution, EWASM, on top of sharding, on top of the beacon chain. And that's, that's the publicly known and publicly discussed plan for Ethereum 2.0. Um, that's what they intend to do. As they start implementing it, who knows? We'll find out what the real issues are. I mean, Casper was supposed to ship by now. But, you know, this stuff could be incredibly awesome. EWASM, I think, is really interesting. And the reason I like it is because WASM is becoming a, um, an industry standard. And we'll be able to throw more analysis tools at these smart contracts than you would have now that could look for all the sorts of exploits. So we can get kind of a, a growth of useful tools. And it also provides an opportunity to um, uh, do things like if you have a new ZK Snark implementation. It's a lot easier to do in WASM than it is inside of um, EVM. Is this all happening in parallel? Or is there yes, these are all happening in parallel. Okay. So it's going to be like another get parity book. This one's in Java and it's got stuff as well. That's the plan. This one's in Java. So it's, yeah, it's, it's comparable to get and parity, but this one's in Java. It's Pantheon and it has these extra features. And you can take them in and out in a modular fashion. Let's plan on how we plan but on supporting them. just wanted to use the core stuff and you could do that too. Yep. That, that's what we ship. So you were saying FastSync is no, they're not using that? Is, is that the same as Warp Sync? Or so Parity's got Warp Sync, and only Parity has Warp Sync. Yeah. Um, Geth has FastSync, and Ethereum J implemented it, and a few others implemented FastSync. What they're trying to do is they want to get a universal one that is consistent across all the clients. There's actually a, a sub-protocol ETH63 that describes the FastSync process. And then there's a parity sub-protocol that describes the warp sync process, which is, I don't know what number it is, but it's one of those, those uh, standards that they specify in the protocol that say, I'm a client, I support these features. Um, so I don't know, you know, they say they're going to start talking about Ethereum magicians, but I think right now everyone's all heads down on making sure Constantinople ships and doesn't break the network. So, so I think this reiterates some of what our plans are for what we've shipped. We've shipped the public chain. We shipped it in October. It's on GitHub. You can download it. You can brew install it. You can run with it. Early next year, we're going to ship our private chain, our enterprise solutions. Um, that's supposed to ship, I think, Q1 is one of the times it's been discussed for when we're going to ship some of this. And 2019 and beyond is when we're going to ship all of our next generation stuff with fancy things like libp2p integration is one of the things they're also looking at. Um, and some of the customers, the types of people are targeting, um, Microsoft Viant. Viant is a, um, I knew this, I read this morning. Viant and Kaleido do about the same thing. Viant, Kaleido does basically what AWS announced this morning, except they do it on a blockchain. They provide prepackaged blockchains. Viant is business processes. That's what they're doing. Business processes on blockchains. And uh, they're going to be using us underneath as the plan. That's what we're, we're pushing towards, or get. Um, and in Fura, and Truffle. We're completely Truffle compliant. You can use all the Truffle stuff on a Pantheon blockchain right now, Pantheon client. And of course, the Enterprise with Ethereum Alliance is also who we're targeting. All right. More details, gory details on the technical roadmap. Any questions about technical roadmap plans? It's a big wall of text saying basically what I've already said going over already. So when you say um, mainnet passwords, that mean like everything is implemented already, but if I went to one where it's kind of downloaded, then use it in place of like, yeah. Yes, yes. Once, once you're fully synced up, you can um, run it just like you would any other node. Um, we've shown examples where we hooked Remix up to it, and Remix works fine, Truffle works fine. Um, you can use all the JSON RPC. And the key to that is a lot of these features or a lot of these toolkits is they hook in through the JSON RPC protocols. So we implement all the ones that are required to get the functionality that they need. So you could point to your Web3 instances. If you have your own Pantheon node running an AWS instance, you could point it there to get all the information you want there. Um, and it works just like another peer in the network. So it's going to talk with Parity and, and Geth and Ethereum J and Ethereum JS and all the other random clients that are out there. Um, it's going to work like a peer and share everything else out there. Can you run it as just a test node as well? Yes. That's mostly how I do my development. My favorite one right now is the Gorley test net. Um, they've actually taken what was a geth only uh, implementation of a proof of authority network called Click, 
and we've implemented Click, and they've got a branch of Parity that implements Click. They're going to be shipping here pretty soon. So it's a proof of authority test net across three different clients, and that's actually kind of an exciting thing to have happen um, because Coven was Parity only, Rinkby was Geth only, um, and I think there was another. Robston Rops, is actually a proof of work. Um, so, and it's that, that kind of it's kind of an interesting one because people don't always point a lot of hash in it. When something exciting is going to happen, they'll point a bunch of hash in it there. But the reason people don't is because the economics, Rink, uh, Robston coins aren't really worth anything. So no one's motivated to mine. But Ethereum is worth something. So people keep their hash pointed at what gives them money. But you know, as far as test nets, Robston's interesting because you get the inconsistent block times versus like Rink B and Coven and Galeri, you get you get the more consistent block times because everyone's there and taking their turns. So all right. Did we cover everything on there. We have Azure and Docker images available. I think that's one thing I haven't talked about yet. Yeah, I think I already talked about most of that. Um, we have uh, Microsoft Azure has um, uh, de deployment kits where you can deploy Pantheon into their node like they have just about every other blockchain system out there already. Um, so a little bit about our about the three teams that we have. The research team, um, they're working on a lot of the Ethereum 2.0 features. Um, they're, they're in the ETH 2.0 calls. Um, they're doing um, some of the, uh, the beacon chain is the big thing that's being pushed right now. We're trying to get a second client in addition to Prismatic Labs for their, their desired I think they're targeting a February launch for the Beacon Chain testnet. So we're trying to get up and running on that. Um, and our, you know, all the other various bits that's going into 2.0, we're working on and looking at it. Side change is something that's not Ethereum 2.0 that they're also researching. And those are some of the new interesting features that are coming in with it. And our standards group um, also is doing a lot of interesting things beyond what the core is doing. Um, they're working with Enterprise Ethereum Alliance. I've got some slides coming up for that. They're also working with IEEE, W3C, and other standard organizations. Um, there's like a privacy group going on in W3C that we're trying um, to make sure that we have a seat at the table for the privacy requirements. Since W3C is changing around since the whole bit with Watwig and HTML5, it's, it's kind of an exciting time to be, to be in standards. It's an interesting time. And of course, the core open source software. Right now, all of our software that we ship and we use is in the open. It's all on GitHub. You can download it. You can build it. You can see my commits go on in, on a weekly basis. So why Pantheon? Uh, before we go into the why Pantheon, got a couple of set slides on why Pantheon and why Pegasus. Any questions about Enterprise? Cool. I do have one question. Um, Pantheon yes. So when you tell, tell us a little bit more about the work with the uh, triple I, triple A and uh, um, I don't know that much, so I can't. I <laughs> it's not that I did. It's curious. So. Yeah, um, I know a little bit because we just had a, a uh, offsite for our team in Prague the week after DevCon, and I talked to some of the standards guys. Um, but you know, with the whole stuff that's going on with um, with the Facebook and, and you know all your data being shared and Google and all this information well, being shared around. Well, can you just tell me this is the first time I'm hearing that there's been collaboration there. I didn't realize. Right. That. So I was just wondering to what depth is the cooperation with those organizations and blockchain. Right. Groups? We're, we think there's a solution for blockchain for a lot of those items. We're trying to get in a seat on those tables. And it's a persuasion game to, pers to persuade them that the technology is useful to solve some of the goals that they have. So there's no working groups together in that? Um, not yet. Yeah. We're working That's on that. Curious, yeah. okay, cool. We're in the process of try trying to get them. There might be. I, you know, I'm not the standards guy. I'm sure there's interest. I just didn't know how widespread it was. Yeah. So I think I discussed all of these already about Pantheon. Um, as far as going for Ethereum, for enterprise Ethereum, we can get you know different consensus mechanisms that some corporations might be more excited about. We have a modular architecture. In the Java base, Java's really allowing us to do a lot of things with the pluggability that aren't quite as easy in Go and Rust. Um, Java ships, they, you know, you can, there's ways that you can ship a single binary that you can just give to people, but typically, when you deploy a Java application, it's a series of multiple files called jars. And from this, we can put various features in different jars. So if you don't want PBFT, you can just take that PBFT jar, take it out. 
and it won't be impacting any of your other code, won't be available in your command line, and it won't affect you. Um, at the same time, if you want to write a custom backend database implementation, let's say you really, really need to store your blockchain data on Oracle database instead of RocksDB, you can write your own um, backend data store, put it in, plug it in, and it works for you. And another important thing that I don't think has been on these slides yet is we're Apache 2 licensed. Actually, it's going to come up on a slide a bit later. So because it's Apache 2 licensed, you can write that custom backend integration and not be required to share it back. Um, simplified deployment. Java is a well-known quantity in enterprise circles. They know how to secure it. They know how to deploy it. They know how to keep it up and running. Um, some enterprises like it. Some enterprises don't like it. But all enterprises know how to work with it. So that's one of the great things about Java. Um, tomorrow we're going to be shipping privacy. Um, there's multiple privacy approaches, on-chain privacy, off-chain privacy. Um, those are the, you know, the two main variants, quorum, um, off-chain transactions, and ZK Snarks are the typical solution for on-chain transactions. Um, permissioning, like I said, if you, do, you don't want to have to have one key shared amongst the whole HR, everyone can have their own key. And when they need to update an employee record on your internal blockchain, you come in, you take the HR role, and our smart contracts will allow you to do that and act within that role. So it allows you to do minimum permissioning as well, since good security models. And Ethereum 2.0, they're, they're working and doing great stuff. This is the slide I was talking about. So here are some, some key differentiators between three broad categories of, of Ethereum clients. Um, the first one is represented by Quorum and also includes stuff like uh, Hyperledger Bureau, uh, which started out as Monax. And the second one is Parity, which represents the mainline um, Ethereum clients like Geth and Parity and Ethereum JS. And then, you know, this is, of course, it's targeted towards selling to, this, to business people. So we've got the check boxes, and this is Pantheon. So the first major difference is the license. Pantheon is Apache 2.0 licensed. How many here are familiar with open source licensing issues? Not many. So the GPL has a particular term in the, in the license called the copyleft clause. And what that means is if, you, if, I give you a piece of, um, if I give you a piece of software that's licensed under the GPL and I've made changes, you have the right to say, hey, give me the source code for those changes. Um, that's happened with uh, Linksys routers. They used to ship Linux and they customized the Linux kernel. So anyone that bought one of those Linksys routers um, could say, hey, Linksys, I want to see the, the uh, Linux kernel changes that you did for that. And by terms of the license, they had to give it to you. So GPL has a strong software must remain free uh, license model. Apache is a more permissive model. Um, you have the right to take that Apache 2.0 software, make changes, and ship it to them. And whether or not you give them the changes is, is an issue of social contract. You have permission to give it to them. You have permission to keep it from them. And a lot of enterprises like this because they're concerned that if they take software in-house and they do changes, it's integrated with their back-end software that exposes all sorts of interesting things about the way their architecture is set up. If they accidentally ship this software in a qualifying way to a customer, they can say, give me all the software changes you've done to this Linux kernel that expose the changes you've done to the back-end. So because of that, a lot of enterprises, when they see GPL, they say, absolutely not. We need the right to keep our secrets. You know, we may share these, these may be good things, but at the end of the day, we want to be able to say, no, this is our secret sauce. This is our core business value. We don't want to share it. And Apache gives them that right. So we take our software, we license it under Apache, we give them right to use it, and we encourage them to give it back, but we don't require it from them. So we're relying more on the social contract. Because in some situations, um, in open source software, um, you know, you, we, don't, we don't want to require people to give up their, their core business value. So that's, they have the right to do that, and they have the right not to do that. The second check mark is enterprise grade level one through three support. Um, as we get enterprise customers, we're going to be spinning up this 24 seven support. So whereas a company, we've got 50 people, we've got lots of engineers and all the time zone, all the major time zone buckets that you need to handle. If something goes down on your Ethereum client, you can call it up and you can get a support person and they can get an engineer who's going to be awake at that time of the day and start working on your issues. That's not something that can be guaranteed. You can't pay for that in parity. You can't pay for that in quorum right now. Um, but you can pay for that um, in, in Pantheon. That's something that we're going to be rolling out, something we're going to be delivering is enterprise grade support for these features. And the last one is public chain compliant. That's really what differentiates Quorum 
and Burrow from Parity and Geth. Um, Quorum and Burrow, they support Ethereum, but they don't support all the current hard forks. They'll support the, 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 the um, like the homestead level of, of um, EVM codes that are in there, but they won't necessarily support the new stuff that's coming out in Constantinople. There's some interesting bit twiddling um, JVM codes that are coming out that are really essential for some of the stuff they're doing in things like ZK Snarks and other fancy encryption things that they want to be able to do on chain. And it also means that it's compatible with the, um, with the current peer-to-peer -peer communications that go between these chains. So Parity is compatible with it, um, Pantheon, but not Quorum and Monax. So if you want to be able to go on chain, if you, never, if you never want to hit the public chain, then that's fine. But if you do, that's one of the things that we enable. I think I've talked about this core values. Oh, native tokens. Um, Hyperledger doesn't have native tokens. If you want to support native tokens, you can do it. You can also set your gas to zero. That's a configuration option. I've seen both things done. Um, tooling. We support all the Ethereum tools. We also have support for things like um, uh, a lot of the, the Java tooling that goes in, a lot of the performance that goes in. Uh, I think I covered the others. Docker and Fure Kubernetes. I think I've covered this one. What would the native tokens, like what purpose would they serve in a private blockchain? So that's one thing that the uh, Enterprise Ethereum Alliance specification requires. It needs to be some sort of anti-abuse mechanism. So one way to do the anti-abuse mechanism is to maintain the internal tokens. I mean, you know, you just go to the, you could have a corporate faucet, you know, hey, give me my permission to get the money so I can, you know, do these transactions. And you just keep people on a short leash so they can't spam the transactions. You give it out freely. So you run out of tokens, you can't flood the network anymore. Another approach that is permitted under the EEA is to do things like rate limiting of clients and limiting who can, you know, by, by permission, you can only sub submit so many um, transactions. So in a private network, you would use tokens mostly as anti-abuse mechanisms. And in a consortium, mm -hmm. you might actually use it to justify who needs to pay for what services. So it could be used as an accounting token of utility. You've used this much registration, so you need to pay for that, or you provided this much value, so we're going to give you this money out of the share pools. Or it's you know it's a rich area of token economics that uh, have, have hasn't we only had a few years to look into it. So this slide, not the th oh yeah, this slide is talking about Java. So one of the questions we get a lot about Pantheon is why did we pick Java? Um, apart from the fact it's been around since the 20th century. And like I said before, it's about the enterprises. It's got a huge open source community, and it's got a mature ecosystem. And one of the things about the mature open source community, um, I, I come from a job background. I'm a career job programmer. I've been doing it since, since when I first started. My, my first job was Java, and I've always done Java. Um, when I was getting into blockchain, there wasn't really any Java clients, any Java utility. If you want to do blockchain, you generally had to either write it yourself or learn a new platform that wasn't Java. You know, well, Node's not new that, that new anymore, but Node doesn't really have a lot of penetration into the Java enterprise houses that employ Java people. Um, Go has some penetration. Um, JavaScript, I mean, of course, if you front end, you know JavaScript. That's pretty easy. Um, but as far as blockchain projects in Java, it's a rich, fertile area for us to, to be able to recruit new, new developer talent. And I've heard many times said before that one of the biggest growth impediments for blockchain is access to developers. We need to get more developers. So if we can tap a rich new ecosystem of people who have been doing Java for years, and now they can do blockchain with what they know. So I think that's the one thing that I haven't addressed before. And these are the three sorts of, oh yeah, bilateral privacy is one thing that I missed. And that's just a, a fancy word for symmetric encryption. I hold a key, you hold a key. We put a secret on the chain. We can read it. Um, that's one approach to do it. ZK, but no one can prove that it's what's in the secret without having the, the key. ZK snarks are interesting. I think Zuko's been here to talk about those before. Um, where you can prove that you kept the ledger balanced, and you can prove that it's balanced, but you don't have to show what's mm -hmm. on the ledger. And then there's uh, on-chain privacy. There's also off-chain privacy, where you basically do your commitments on a separate side chain, and you leave record of it on the main chain to prove that you've done it. That's Quorum's main solution. And another comparison with Corda, Hyperledger, and Pantheon. Anyone here use Corda or Hyperledger? Familiar with it? Okay. 
it's, an, it's, it's quite a different approach that they have to a lot of these things, but Corda is mostly focused on, on finance houses already, and they already have their small community, their, their focused community narrow. Hyperledger, um, IBM is big on Hyperledger. They have a meetup in Denver that I've been meaning to go to. Um, just haven't been able to go to get Tuesdays off. I think it, it's Tuesdays or Thursdays. It's, it's a hard day for me to meet, go there. And uh, Pantheon. And there's you know some comparisons, AWS and number of nodes on the network. Why Pegasus? Our researchers do all sorts of cool publications and they speak at conferences. You probably read our blog posts. Um, if you read anything by Bet Eddington, who's some of the Ethereum 2.0 lead stuff, he's, he's written a lot of these before. Um, we're a part of consensus. Um, as many of you probably know, consensus is what's known as a venture production studio. They have a core hub where they do core features, but really what they're trying to do is they're trying to create companies within, within consensus and spin them out. They've already had a couple of companies spin out and be standalone companies. Gnosis is one of them and be successful standalone companies. But they have a lot of different projects and they have a large worldwide scope. They have large footprints in a lot of different countries and they have developers working everywhere. And just a, a funny note, when I was putting these slides, I actually had to go in and I had to recolor Tasmania because they didn't think Tasmania was part of Australia when they colored this slide. So, but New Zealand, I guess, we don't have a project in there. Yeah, we've got people in Dallas, Atlanta, Chicago, Toronto, New York, LA, San Francisco, Seattle, Vancouver, Denver, Yucatan, Brazil. We've got consensus employees all over. We're getting pretty big. And we're still hiring. I should emphasize that. Uh, Pegasus is hiring and consensus is hiring. So if you want to check out um, Ethereum, the GitHub, we are Pegasus Eng, because apparently there's another Pegasus, Pegasus Systems. So, um, but Pegasus stands for Protocol Engineering Group and Systems. So that's where we got the name, because um, it's got a nice, you know, initialism to go with it. And we have a Twitter address, and our website is pegasus.tech. And if you want to download and build Pegasus, go for it. GitHub.com slash Pegasus Eng slash Pantheon. You can build it today. All you need is Java 8 or newer, and you can build it, and you can run it on your local network. I would recommend targeting a test net, because that will get you up in syncs quicker in a matter of minutes, rather than hours and hours. You can also run it as an independent node. That's actually the best way to run it. Just run dash dash dev mode, and you get your own independent node. It has some accounts that are set up already with a preset amount of Ethereum, with keys that are publicly known, so please don't use those accounts for personal uses. We've got those hard coded already. So uh, any other questions? Yes? Yeah, uh, is anything really scary about this? Anything you worry about? What's going on and how things are going? Is there anything scary? So, so are you alluding to the recent price drop in Ethereum? Across the board. Across the board? So one of the reasons why I was excited about working at um, Pegasus as opposed to some of the other projects um, in some of the other places is Pegasus were, were targeting enterprises. In addition to being mainnet compliant, we're targeting enterprises. And I think that's where some of the best blockchain growth is going to be. Um, and I think that's independent of the prices. There's, you know, there's going to be a lot of great growth. You know, I think we're going through downtime, mostly because a lot of ICOs are liquidating out and paying for lawyers in case they get hit by the SEC is probably, if you've done an ICO and you're not paying for a lawyer, I mean, you, get, you get what you deserve. Um, but I think that's, a lot of that's what's driving it down. I'm not supposed to speculate about price publicly, but um, I'm not concerned about the price. I didn't join this to get rich off of the Ethereum tokens. Um, I enjoy writing in Java, and I enjoy delivering software that enterprises can use. And I think, you know, this will change the way a lot of enterprises work in a good way um, to be able to provide this. That's great. I mean, is if you were in charge, would you change anything? I was in charge. Would I change anything? So have you heard of what a teal organization is? I kind of am in charge. Kind of everyone is. <laughs> now, I've already changed some things when I came in. There was um, Probably one of the first things I did that was a big wide changing thing, we had some coding standards that said don't use the Java getters and setters. And so one thing I immediately changed is like, no, let's, let's roll that back. Let's put the getters and setters back in because that's going to get you integration with, with languages like Kotlin depend on these, these idiomatic Java ways of doing things. So um, if there's anything, I would probably keep doing the way we're doing. You know, we're a very decentralized um, 
Self-organizing, I think, is the buzzword that is being used for the way that Pegasus runs its, corp runs its organization, and also all of consensus. But yeah, I, I think I'd keep it this way. It's, it's, a little, it's an adjustment at first, but I think it's a good adjustment. I think it's, it's the way that high-performing organizations are going to be working in the future. Yes, Victoria. The Ethereum client itself uses the yeah. Ethereum tokens? <laughs> they, they already do. Um, if you're going to mount a spam attack, it costs money. So that provides an immediate limit on it. Back in a couple of years ago when they were writing zeros to all the addresses, whoever was doing that, you know, the Ethereum was worth, what, 10 bucks the token at the time? And it still cost them a lot of money to, to do that. But nowadays, you, there's no way you'd consider that sort of attack on Ethereum. So it's, it's, I think it's already working. It, the laws of economics are keeping the abuse limiting the abuse. You can't run a denial of service attack forever. But if you have enough money, you can. So. With um, like private blockchains, those are much easier to attack, right? There's just not the amount of power to it. Well, it, that's what the consensus mechanism deals with. I mean, if you're doing a, a proof of work private blockchain, oh. it's going to be really easy to attack. Sure. Um, but it, that's why they want to have the, uh, the BVFT, B, generally the proof of authority type networks, where instead of mining, you say that, you know, I'm Bob and I have a right to produce a block, a block every, fifth, every fifth block I can produce that block. Um, every fourth block, if the guy before me forgets, you know, for a lesser value. But that's mostly how the, uh, how the enterprises do it, is they, they limit the block producers. It looks, looks a lot like EOS. Right. I, I guess they still, I mean, like with, with a, a private blockchain, So one of the incentive mechanisms is that if you don't have a node, you can't guarantee that your transactions will get on the chain. So that's one of the reasons why, if you're part of, say, a, a trading network, why you'd want to have a node. Um, is if you're going to publish your transactions to the chain, you need to have a node when it's your turn to guarantee that you're going to publish it. So if you don't have a node, you probably pay someone for the privilege of putting the transactions on. So it changes the economics of how you would do these distributed networks. Um, I think there's, you know, the way Bitcoin was working with the token economics is a very, you know, I'm, someone's going to win a Nobel Prize, uh, Nobel Economics Prize for that. If, if Satoshi can ever prove who he is, um, you know, I think he's right in line for, uh, for Nobel. And if, you know, in 20 years, whoever's done the most with it is probably going to wind up with that Nobel for economics. Because I think to be able to get that self-building system with, with magical tokens that meant nothing initially, and are now worth thousands of dollars, and people run multi-million dollar mining farms in rural China. It's just amazing. But I don't think that's the only way that you can run a distributed application network. So you can just change who's responsible for paying. You know, if you want to get in, you talk to the block producer. It sounds a lot like a banking system. But when you think about it, that's essentially what this is. It's just a banking system. So, so in, in order to access the network, you need to pay for a node, basically? Right. The, the private right. Situation. So you would provide the node, you would participate in the block production, and then you'd be responsible for responding to answers for, you know, Give me this block. There's also validating nodes. You know, Hyperledger's got a more involved architecture for this. You know, those, those nodes that validate and nodes that seal. Um, and basically, you would either provide that service or you'd pay someone to provide that service for you. <coughs> I think is the general economic model for those situations. So like in the lettuce example, um, the farmer wouldn't run a blockchain node, but the supplier might. And Walmart might or might not. They might pay the supplier. <coughs> so to pull your lettuce and give it to the supplier, he would ask for like an, a nickel a bushel to record in the blockchain. And that's just, you know, to get your certification that I picked it up at this point. So that's, that's some of the ways that the economics might work out. Not an economics major, just, just spitballing here. Is there another question? Um, I was just wondering when you guys were really like fancy on what kind of some of the big roadblocks or some of the biggest challenges is going around the network. So it wasn't the networking piece. One of the challenges we ran into that was, was quite surprising was that there were some ambiguities in the yellow paper. Um, you know, and we had to you know, work with some of the, the people who were, who were familiar with Geth. Um, the other challenge is we were trying to write at Apache 2. So that limited the amount of code that we could refer to. We couldn't copy any code from anyone else in. 
and that limited how we got access to how we can, can produce the code to keep a quote unquote clean room. So I think the specification, and then even then, you know, the specification says one thing and the network acts a different way. There are certain emergent behaviors that we found surprising that we didn't expect until you actually write some of these things. Um, and just the things you learn about clients, like Parity had a bug in um, there when you when you do compression under the under the v5 version, you know there's a flag that says use snappy compression to reduce the con the, the information. Um, sometimes they fix this bug, they got rid of it, but some people are still running old versions of Parity. If it decides it's going to disconnect after starting the compression, it'll just send an uncompressed goodbye message, and that. You know, we have, we validate our protocol, we see a compression that fails, so we freak out, throw an exception, and do breach of protocol. But now that we know to expect that, we fail a lot more quietly. We don't put a giant exception, we don't freak out. We just say, oh, they don't know what they're doing, we'll just get rid of them. So those are some of the things that we're learning. You know, what really is worth freaking out about and, you know, throwing a bunch of stack traces over versus what happens all the time. And that's just the way that these clients behave. And I think that's one of the strengths that Ethereum is going to have over many other blockchain networks, is that there are multiple clients, multiple viable clients, and multiple reasons to one of these viable clients, that the protocol really is the king. It's not the software running the protocol, it's the protocol itself. So, you know, we have these multiple clients running against it, and there's no, there's a preference among the, uh, if there was a really class of Ethereum, um, there is a preference among them to have these multiple clients, to have multiple ways to do it. So if, if, you know, for example, if we decide that all of a sudden we're not going to do RLP, that Ethereum is going to use, um, going to use protobufs, you know, we can't just declare that unilaterally. We need to get consensus from everyone to do that. So I think that really helps the stability of Ethereum as a whole, and that's why I'm a bigger fan of Ethereum than I am of other blockchains. So in, in terms of the other clients, um, how does So we just shipped a working client, so we're not the best. <laughs> um, we don't have all the bells and whistles. We haven't spent any time optimizing. We spent all of our time on correctness up until this point. So that's one of the things that we're going through in the, our current sprints. As we're putting in the benchmarking stuff, we're going to start benchmarking it. We already have some ideas where there are some rich opportunities to improve our performance. Um, for example, we, we use RocksDB, but we haven't done any tuning on RocksDB. We just count on it working. We haven't tuned any cache sizes. We haven't you know, done any rewrite buffers. We just want it to be rock solid. And that, you know, that, that goes with what I've learned from other, you know, I used to work at Google. Um, that fits in with their approach. Make it correct, make it fast in that order. So we've been focusing on making it fast, making it correct, and now we're gonna work on making it fast. But did, did you then work on making it fast before like, the enterprise features were exactly Yes, it'll impact those as well, because we're using the same core, you know, the enterprise features There'll be consensus mechanisms and private transactions on top of the core Ethereum. So that's, that's always the plan, is that the core Ethereum is what's going to be used in addition to it. I forgot to read the speaker notes. We have people from RSA. Um, I'm from Google. We have a couple other Googler, former Googlers on the team. Um, we have people who graduated from MIT. Um, got big brains from, from all of it. You know, it's like I'm walking in. I, near, I knew about this company back in June. And I thought about applying, and I just like got total imposter syndrome. There's no way I'm good enough to work here. And then the recruiter comes to me a few months later and says, hey, you want to work at Pantheon? I was like, wow, can I? So and it turns out I can. So that's, that's you know, kind of a lesson in imposter syndrome that I think needs to be set out is you probably, if you're smart enough to get here, you're probably smart enough to work at a lot of these companies that are out there. You know, a lot of it is just the initiative and the willingness to go out and take a chance and do something that you haven't done before. Just leverage the experience you've had before. So you know a lot of these. You know they, you know Vitalik four years ago. It's like who was this guy? And now he's they've got T-shirts with Biddle on it. You know like he's some like he's some deified person. It's kind of interesting. And it's just because he had an idea, he went out and he he took a chance. So if there's one takeaway from this, you know like I said, a year ago I was completely on the outside of Ethereum, and now I'm a blockchain protocol engineer here. Reach out, take a chance, use your existing leverage, le leverage your existing skills. And it's growing so fast, there's absolutely a place for you if you want to get in on it. Cool. Yeah. Let's wrap it up on that note. Yep. <laughs> I have stickers. Awesome. Texas and Logan's.